in the rec room. I believe before that, the ping pong table and pool table were in the next room down. The Air Force wanted to have its personnel um, have things to do on slow times or their hours off. This room was made to look like a family type living room. The furniture was added. This wall was added to separate it from the dining area. And they did have satellite TV out here with various games. And on this side of the hall is a phone booth. Personnel could make 10 minute phone calls to family or to conduct business. But those calls were recorded and they were listened to since this was a top secret facility. Here we've got some basketballs and some board games, a few cleaning supplies. There is a basketball hoop out on the parking lot. And this, this building is, um, just has a variety of pictures. That's my favorite one right there. But uh, wildlife, scenery, birds, I've only heard of one other site, and that was decorated all with wildlife photographs and wildlife mounts. The cook served four meals a day. That was breakfast, lunch, dinner, and mids. Mids was the late night meal, mainly for that night security crew. Of the six security people on the site, three were on duty during the day. The other three were on duty at night. Columns one and three were called foil packs. They were similar to TV dinners, but there was only one food inside each pack. All these packs were made out at the base near Cheyenne, Wyoming, and they were trucked to the different wings. Other duties that the cook had, um, doing the inventory and doing all the ordering. Uh, shipment of food came to the site once a week. Some of the cooks just heated the foil packs and served them that way. Other cooks emptied them out and served them on a plate as a meal. Some cooks did home cooking from scratch, some did not. The enlisted personnel did not pay for their meals, but if there were officers on the site, they paid, but it wasn't very much. Here is the women's restroom that was um, made space for from the storage area. You can walk into the kitchen. call it the origin room. It has the original tile and the original seafoam green wall color. And everyone cleaned up after themselves. So after everyone's shift, they would have stripped their beds, put their linens in the chute. The chute just goes into a wooden box behind the wall. There was no laundry here, so all the linens were taken back to the base for washing. The Air Force even took the garbage back to the base. It was like they left no trace of their existence here after each shift was over. And the men's restroom. Yeah. <laughs> the first bedroom is for the cook. There is an extra bunk in there. Once in a while there was a cook trainee on the site. And the cook was second in command on the top side of the building. The next two rooms are identical. That one would be for the day shift security team. This next one is for the night shift security team. This one has tin foil on the windows to keep the light out during the day when they're trying to sleep. And you can walk in there. 
The four symbols on the doors are international wildcat symbols, meaning there could be explosives in these rooms. They did keep their guns and ammo in the closets. And these are the only two rooms that have this additional cipher lock on the door. These rooms and the public areas have the red strobe lights on the ceiling. And all of the rooms have the intercom system. So you can play with the guns if you want. They are part of that. And there's two closed doors on this side of the hall. They were guest bedrooms, and they look just like this one down here. There were three bunks in each. There could have been additional maintenance teams, security teams, inspection teams. Some te teams may have gotten trapped out here in the bad weather. And feel free to walk into the last bedroom. That one is for the facility manager. And the manager was boss of the topside people. And duties included a lot of maintenance. It's uh, schematics for the different machinery hanging on the wall. The manager did any disciplinary action if that was needed. Removed the snow, mowed the grass. Just kept everything in tip-top, smooth, running order. The manager also put the inventory in the closet that contained the clean linens, basic Yes, we'll get it done. Thank you. Um, straight out here, you'll see a concrete mushroom. That is for in air intake for the capsules down below. There's another one out there that is for air exhaust. And if any military vehicles needed fuel, each one carried a card. They would run the card there. And the fuel pumps were backed by the um, double garages back here. There. It's rickety. I don't open it very often. <laughs> I got it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I expect the whole thing to come cascading <laughs> off the wall one day. <laughs> this is the security control center. This door was always locked. Notice the slot in the door. That was for oncoming people to pass their ID papers through. And down under these metal panels on the floor, that uh, communication cable is bundled, runs through the building, out across the parking lot, and then to the other sites. If you're interested in old electrical boxes, most of this is obsolete now. Yeah, I remember those. <laughs> some people aren't interested, some just think it's fascinating. <laughs> the wall shows the whole road system. Um, there is another site you can visit. It's November 33. We are right here. November 33 is back through Cooperstown and it's three quarter, two and three quarter miles east on Highway 200. It's on the south side of the road. You'll see the chain link fence. It has been put back to look like it did when it was active, and there's interpretive signs out there. The controller of whichever security team was on duty was stationed in this office. All of the surveillance was visual. There were no cameras, no motion detectors at these sites. 
So the controller would watch the gate, watch the fence. You can't see the whole fence from here. So twice this shift, the other two on that security team would walk the fence. The controller would watch the gate if any vehicles approached. Everyone who had a reason to be on this site would have received a code before leaving the base. The controller would also have a copy of those codes. The oncoming people had to push it back and forth. They would have come around the front, had all their ID papers matched. They would have been admitted. If they were armed, they would have been asked to step over to this clearing barrel. It's a 55-gallon drum filled with sand and concrete. It has a coffee can in it. They would have rested the rifles, the barrels here, unloaded, and then done a trigger pull just to make sure the chamber was empty. Then they would have stored the guns in these cabinets. The glass is not bulletproof, but those shades are mirrored so people from the outside cannot see in. Here, everything would have been demolished. Um, the two green boxes behind you there are telecommunications equipment. The one on the wall is the transmitter receiver. And the weather station is operational. It's not often we see wind that low in North Dakota. Any questions so far? People who might have had a reason to go down, um, the new team of missileers came on the site every morning. Maintenance, um, inspection teams, uh, brass might have wanted to go down and look the situation over. Um, these people would have also received codes. Their button. Um, this is the switch that operates those red strobe lights and sirens. We do have an Otis elevator guy come once a month to check everything out. The emergency ladder goes down about 40 feet. It's used in case of elevator failure or fire. The Historical Society put the protective gates on there. And then on the other wall, you'll see the first piece of artwork. That was done in 1994. It is initial. Things like this would not have been allowed in the early years, but some things became less strict as time went on. In the video, you saw how the capsules down below were constructed. Once they were finished and the elevator shaft was all finished, everything that went inside those capsules came through the double doors and down the elevator. That is called the break-in kit, and I will explain more about that once we get down and you see the blast doors. It will be loud.
the central area, what people would have seen were the two glass doors closed. In this direction is the launch control equipment building that was unmanned. All of this equipment was running on its own to support the missileers and their mission on the other side. Uh, people who might have had a reason to go into this equipment building would have been maintenance, inspection teams, uh, the missileers before they went on duty did go in there. You'll notice that there are metal pins on each side of the door. And by pumping the hydraulic handle, about two minutes, they could pump those pins in or out of the holes on the door frame. It's a 13 ton door, but it was so meticulously balanced that one person could open or close it. On the far left is the latching locking mechanism. Uh, and then the handle they would turn in whichever direction, whether they were opening or closing the door. If this door settled, or if there was a malfunction of the hydraulic handles, that's when they would bring in that break-in kit, if the door had gotten stuck shut. They would take off a panel on the other side of the door. What that box contained was a jack, pulleys, and chains. In here, you'll notice that the floor doesn't go way up flush to the wall, and all of the equipment is bolted down to the floor. Both capsules are designed this way. In each corner of the floor, you'll see there is a green shock isolator. We're actually on a suspended floor, so had there been a near hit, these isolators would have taken up a lot of the movement and the floor could have been swinging for the safety of the equipment. Um, I'll just name off what the different things are down here. This is a fan and filtration system. And the air compressor, the gray tank for lube oil, and the light color tank for diesel fuel all support the backup diesel generator. There was a much larger diesel tank outside the capsule wall. The backup generator is no longer functional. And on this side of the building is the brine chiller. It was a salt solution that provided the cooling. And the gold tube going over to the capsule wall made out of flexible material. That is the air intake tube. The air exhaust tube is back behind the generator. Within these tubes are automatic closures. A near hit would have caused fluctuating air pressure outside. That would have caused these tubes to automatically shut off immediately. That would keep the contaminated air out of the capsule. The gray box, green box with all the dials and knobs has to do with adjusting and pressurizing the shock isolators. And the silver cable air dryer box right here. Um, that underground cable was pressurized. There was nitrogen pumped through it. Nitrogen kept the corrosion rate down inside the cable. There was paper where the junctions were, and that nitrogen helped keep that paper dry. There is a phone and headset over there. And uh, in the case of the missileers coming in and doing their check, they would have called the missileers on duty after they had completed that check and told them that they were ready to come over. And the capsules were made in this oval shape because it better withstands the weight of all that dirt packed up above. Smaller opening makes this even a stronger structure. The difference is this door only opens from the inside, so it's additional protection for those missileers on duty. Up here, it says no loan zone. That meant that one person could never be in this area. It had to be the team of two for checks and balances. And on the 
door frame. The top warning is the date and time of deactivation. with some chains on it and two bars in front. So what that was, a tube filled with sand. It stopped about 10 feet below ground. It had a metal cap on it. The theory was, if there had been a near hit here, the missileers did have food and water stored under the floor for 21 days. They had battery backup for six hours. There were two huge batteries that barely fit through that opening. So had they decided at some point they wanted to try and escape, um, undoing that hatch, the chains are there so it doesn't come way open. The bars are there so that if the sand did gush out, it wouldn't knock the missile ear under the floor and bury him in the sand. Um, sand runs out, they climb up, there's a shovel position there somewhere, they would have undone that metal cap and dug their way to the surface. There wouldn't have been anything up there, but that was the theory. Um, that sand may have solidified over the years, or it may have turned to glass, and that cap may have welded itself shut with the heat of the glass. So I did ask a missile there inspector one time if he thought those escape hatches would have really worked, and he said no. They were pretty much put there as a psychological reassurance that they did have a way out. Uh, at times, it was allowed that the cook could deliver food down here. Um, I don't know if it was the wing or the squadron or the facility manager. I don't know who made those rules. I just know that um, some of the 30 years it was allowed, sometimes it was not. And they did have a fridge and microwave. I always get a kick out of this note that has survived all these years. <laughs> so, very small bathroom. Um, this is the last wing that was built. This one was chosen for shutdown or deactivation over the wing at Minot because this wing had more water problems in the silos. Um, the capsules at Minot are much smaller than this. Um, a, a man can reach out his arms and almost touch from wall to wall. They're also shorter. Their bathroom is smaller. The sink is on, on top of the toilet on the back side. This black tank is a tank that would have uh, pressurized their emergency water supply under the floor. There's also the green shock isolators, one in each corner. This is all communication equipment going down this side. This is telephone, digital, telephone, radio, and underground cable. All of this created a lot of heat, so each tower does have a cooling duct going down to protect the equipment. The big copper bar goes around three sides of the capsule. It acted as a halo and grounded the electrical equipment. So be careful not to trip on the rails, and they were here simply to allow the missileers to scoot back and forth to reach all of their equipment. Those are airline seats. They were not belted in day to day. They would have belted themselves in had they been expecting a hit. And be careful not to hit your head on these gauges. There were two missileers on duty um, for a 24 hour period. One was on duty, one was off duty. I don't know if they did it 12 and 12, or how they divided that up. But it didn't matter which missileer was on duty. They were stationed here. This is called the deputy station or the support station. 
they had to keep these two panels of lights in view at all times. You saw in the video how the oncoming team of missileers took their locks off the box and left. The oncoming missileers put the new authentication code booklet in the box, and the two keys for the consoles were also stored in there, and then they would have put their locks on. Each missileer was issued his or her own combination lock. Had they ever gotten the order to launch, that is when they would have taken the contents out of the box. We have a key displayed on the lower right-hand panel of each console. The keyhole is behind the plastic guard. They would have called the other four flights a flight within the squadron. They could choose which squadron they were or which flight they were watching by moving this dial. So, had everyone received the same message, they would have done further decoding. And as they went through their steps, hold, standby, enabled, these lights would have lit up in horizontal rows. The enabler is on the commander's console. The upper right hand panel has a square empty hole. We have never had the enabler here. That would have been top secret. The enabling code was entered right above the box in that little window. And then the commander would have done the countdown, three, two, one, and they would have turned their keys simultaneously. That would have sent one bolt to launch. Launch needed two bolts. Another flight would have then gone through the same procedure. And when those two missileers turned their keys, that would have sent that second bolt. The missiles were pre-targeted. The missileers knew how many they were to launch. They did not know the targets. And other things on this console, and the reason it had to be watched 24-7, if everything was fine, the top row would be lit across green. If anything lit up in the security row, that meant that the motion detector or vibration detector at a silo site had picked up something. They didn't know what it was. The missileer would call that controller up above. The other two on the team would go out and check it out. They had a Captain Loving served over 320 alerts as a missileer, and an alert was simply a 24-hour shift. So he spent almost four years working underground one day at a time. And over here, we have Oscar the Grouch as the mascot of Oscar Zero. The deputy of the missileer team was the first lieutenant, as indicated by the one silver bar. The commander of the team was a captain with the two silver bars. The 448 is their squadron number. These next are earplugs. It is sound deadening fabric around the bunk. There's a fan in the middle of the bunk that made it more like white noise when they were trying to sleep. And then farther down, you'll see all of the items that uh, donated by former missileers. And this capsule was heated, had it not been, um, it would have been 40 degrees in heat by someone who was evidently a Molly Hatch. The sunflake, sun on one side, snowflake on the other, represent. I'm not sure, I know it wasn't done in all of them. But in 1991, missileers started signing the wall. Yep. Here we go. 
Thank you. silo where they shoot the missile out how to shoot the missile and here are the boundaries of the missile site